Okay, dokie. So today's kind of a hybrid between um, part of the workshop and, uh, well, part of the install and part of the orientation to Android. Uh, because hopefully, how many people have Java installed already? Good, good. How many people have uh, Eclipse installed already? Oh, good. I said, look, you guys paying attention. That's really good. Android Toolkit, Android stuff. Okay, not as many, not as many. So let me show you a few things. I'll start out assuming that you already have Java installed. If you don't, take a look at the CD-ROM. What's on the CD-ROM, you might ask? This is the contents of the CD-ROM that I just gave you. And the CD-ROM has a Mac and also has a Windows uh, directory. And it has a readme file. The readme file is probably the most important, actually, of the whole thing. If you look inside, you'll see the Android SDK, which is actually kind of old, but it's not bad because you can upgrade inside of Eclipse, and I'll show you that. And we have Eclipse on here as well if you don't have Eclipse installed. And we have uh, the uh, Windows and also the, I believe for the Java on the disk, there's the 32-bit and the 64-bit version, and also for Eclipse. However, if it's not on there and you have a 60, if, if, if you have a 32-bit system, you're 100% good. If you have a 64-bit system, I'm not sure if that stuff actually made it on the disk or not because the disk started filling up and we didn't have enough room to put all of the different packages on there. So, Say that one more time. You can, but you might have to download it. It might not be on the disk I gave you. If you have a 32-bit system, everything is on the disk. If you have a 64, you might be missing a few components. Maybe not, but you might be missing it. All right, so what I want to do is kind of give you an overview and run through, and I've got a system here that I don't have anything installed on. Well, I have Java installed on here. And uh, the way I can tell, in fact, let me just check real quick to make sure I actually have a Java installed on here. This is, I've, what I've done is gone to a DOS prompt, and I'm going to type in Java C. Make sure you type in Java C and not Java, because Java will work, actually, if you have the runtime environment on there. But this is what I want. I want all the errors to come up. If you have a MacBook, you're typing in on the terminal window. You're not using that. So if you're on the Mac side... You're going into the terminal window and you're typing Java C and you're getting the same response. The toolkit looks the same, acts the same, runs the same. I'm not installing it again on my Windows system because if it's not I'm on my Mac system, because if it's not broken, I'm not going to fix it. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to play around with this Windows system because most people have more difficulties on the Windows than they do on the Mac, but it's the same installation. Whoops. I'm also going to run through VirtualBox with you today and talk about how VirtualBox is used as a replacement emulator for the default emulator that works with the Android Toolkit. Um, so, I'm going to open up my trusty README file. So this file here is on your disk. If you got the disk, it's the README file. For anyone who's having difficulties who are at different stages in the installation, it's not a bad resource to use to pick up where you left off. First, first task was to download and install Java, for which I hope you have done. Most of you raised your hand, said you were. In here, if you don't have it, you can use the links, actually. The links will help you go to the correct place to download it, either the 64 or the 32-bit. You want to download and install Eclipse. As I mentioned before, any version of Eclipse actually works. You're not going to get Eclipse with the Android Toolkit. Eclipse is going to come outside of that. Eclipse installation is kind of interesting. There's none. <laughs> you download or you pull it off the disk. It's a zip file. You unzip the zip file. And let me show you because I don't have Eclipse on this system here. I have to install it actually myself. So I'm going to go to my CD-ROM, which I just copied on the desktop instead of having to actually use the CD-ROM. I'm going to go into the Windows partition. And I'm on a 32-bit, I think. I hope so. <laughs> I'm going to copy it. Actually, I'm just going to double click on it. And, uh, yeah, it's. I'll just drag. Actually, I'll just copy it. Let me just copy and paste it and put it on my desktop. Copy it. Because if this is on your disk, you're going to probably do something similar. Paste it onto my desktop. Then I'm going to unzip the folder. 
Oops. So here's the, I pulled this off the disk. So I'm going to right mouse click, extract all. And then I'm going to wait for a few minutes. There's a lot of files associated with it, but there is no install for Eclipse. Whether you downloaded it from the internet or you got, and this is the Indigo version, by the way, that is uh, installed on the uh, disk or loaded on the disk. It just saves you from having to download a bunch of stuff. So let's see what's going to go on here. <coughs> Hopefully this will... Uh, there we go. Finish. And lo and behold, I have this folder here and uh, don't need to zip file anymore. And uh, what I like to do actually is I rename it, which is kind of a bad practice because this says Indigo on it. So I know which version this is, but if I open up Eclipse, I know which version it is as well. But if I rename it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag and drop it and put it into my file directory here. I'm going to stick it. And this is the interesting part, too, because I'll show you something else I've done. In program files, I've taken the Java directory, which was Java dot something or other dot something or other, and I renamed it to Java. So I can't tell that what, what version of Java this is either. But actually, I see Eclipse is already in here, so I can replace it, actually, just by dragging and dropping it in. No warning? Nothing? Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> Usually there's a warning, right? Or you want to replace it. And then you have to go in to the main directory of the Eclipse folder that you just dragged and dropped. Take and create a shortcut for this round little ball that says Eclipse on it. Put it on the desktop put it wherever you want it. That's the install for Eclipse. So it's not much to install. You're just downloading, unzipping, copying it into your file structure, putting it somewhere on your desk where you'd like to run it from. If you haven't done this already, some of you who are in the object-oriented programming in Java class may have done this already. And then when you click on the icon, it should bring up a little window. The window should have a status bar on the bottom of it. And this is, uh, because I did replace it, it should hopefully uh, be empty. I could remove it, because what I want to do is show you how to get the Android Toolkit to install. So most of you have gotten to this point, because you're in the object-oriented programming in Java class, hopefully, and you've gotten to this point. This is all you need for that class. For Android, you're going to need a little bit more, because in here, it looks like it's pretty empty, actually. It says new Java project. If I go into project, oh, I do see Android in here. Ah, how do I get rid of it? Hold on one second. Let me get rid of it because I want to show you how to install it. Mm hmm. Didn't I just put it out here? I did. Um, hold on. Let me unzip it again. I thought that I had uh, copied it in there. I'm going to remove it first. Here's Eclipse. Here it is. Delete. <laughs> it's gone. One moment while I, while I unzip it again. I thought I had dragged it in there, actually. But I didn't get a message about it overwriting, so perhaps I put it in the wrong directory. What I want to do is show you a clean, un-Android Eclipse version that is ready to be installed. Okay, let me try this one more time. Rename it to Eclipse, just to make it easier. You know what, I'll take it and I'll drag it into here. So let's see, drag it into here. There we go. I have Eclipse. Okay. Actually, I, you know what? I'm just going to. This should be the same shortcut, but let me just make a new shortcut. Run. Okay, this is good. This is a clean install. Okay, so what we're going to be doing in the Android class is the identical thing that we're going to be doing in the object-oriented programming in Java class. 
And uh, if you haven't installed Eclipse before, this is what I was talking about before. It'll ask you for a default workspace directory. Remember where this is because what will end up happening is every time you create a project in Eclipse, as we saw in the previous class, it'll create a folder for you in this directory. You want, you need, which basically what you're going to need to do in order to submit assignments is zip up the folder and send it to me. And then once you've done that, you're done. You don't have to worry about you know, cutting and pasting and creating anything. You just zip the folder up and you post the file in the EMS. Uh, so, but you have to be able to find it. So if you click the little button here, it says use this default folder and don't ask me again. <laughs> You'll never see this window again. So, you know, I'm going to put it, actually I'm going to change the directory because I like to put it in the C drive. So um, I'm going to put this in the C drive instead. So that way I can easily get to my projects. It doesn't matter where you stick it, everything's going to work correctly. So I'm going to say OK. So if I look at my instructions at this point, I have downloaded, uh, number two is download and install Eclipse, which I have just done. And I started up. And so now it says to install step number three, which is where I think we should start, because uh, most of us have gotten this far. Install the Android plugin tools into Eclipse. So when we launch Eclipse, we're going to go to Help, and then we're going to go to Install New Software. So if you have your computer, you can actually do this right now and get everything installed. Ah, this is perfect. So you get one of these things that comes up. This is by how I know I've got a brand new install. It's untainted at this point. And uh, if you go here, you see the workbench. The workbench is that screen that I had up there in the previous class that automatically comes up. If I click on Workbench. If I want to, I can take a tour of Eclipse. And those are those other buttons that were on there, and I can kind of see what's going on. And I don't, I've never actually taken the tour. And I don't like this stuff over here, too. I always get rid of the task window and the outline because it clutters up my screen. But you want to keep the project explorer because then you can switch between different projects. And you want to keep this down here. If you remove this down here, don't worry about it. It'll come back. Every time you compile something or look at the debugger tools, it automatically comes back and shows you status information. So. So now what we're going to do is install the Android Toolkit. <laughs> so now that we're ready to do this, we're going to go into the Help menu, uh, which is the far right menu option, and you go into Install New Software right up here. I, the way that I know that I don't have it installed, hopefully, is I go into New, Project, and I don't see Android on here at all. So I don't have anything installed on here. So now I have to install it. So I go file, excuse me, help is where I'm clicking. And I'm installing new software. It's going to take me to the screen here. The screen is basically going to, it, if, if you're a Unix, Linux person, you're familiar with open source. And you're familiar with uh, packages and websites and distributions and stuff like that. That's what this is, actually. If you're not familiar with Linux and Unix, don't worry about it. What we're doing is we're going to a third-party site that's not owned by Google. It's not owned by Microsoft. It's, a, it's an open-source utility, and it's a plugin that we're installing that works with Eclipse. Just the same way as Eclipse is open-source as well. You can't buy it. Don't buy Android anything. Don't buy Eclipse anything um, because it's, uh, it's free. So if we go and we launch... Eclipse, we go from help into install new software. We see the little window here. That's exactly what I did. This my window had some more options on it. And it's gonna say it's gonna be the same depending on the version of Eclipse you're using. In the available software window, and the reason why I'm showing this to you is because if you have that disk I just gave you, you can open up this file and you can do this, you can copy it. <laughs> Instead of having to type it. So I'll highlight it, copy it, and we're gonna paste it in. So name the site Android plugin or whatever you want to do. Well, let me just show you how to do it. Uh, in the location, we're going to go to this URL. This URL, actually, it is, it's, it, I, the earlier one wasn't owned by Google. This one looks like, apparently, it looks like it's being run by Google because I see Google in the URL line. But what we're doing, in fact, you can do this for other software as well. Um, so what we're going to do is click on Add. Because I want to add a new site to this list, and I click on Add. I'm just going to put the URL in here, actually, as the name and as the location. And I'm going to say OK. 
And it's pending here because it's going to go out now and look for it and see what it can find at that URL. And then it's going to populate this screen with what's available. And there's only two things that are available on that site, actually. There should be two or three things. And we're pending. And we are pending. And we're pending. And if everybody's using the internet right now, we're going to be pending for a while. <laughs> and we are pending. So while we're pending, I'll go back and redo the uh, instructions. So we have added the site. We press OK. And then we select, and this is what we're going to get, these two items. Uh, hopefully, let me see if it's there yet. Oops. Oops, wrong, wrong, wrong Windows version. Here we go. Still pending. Well, eventually that should populate with the sites. Is anybody's working right now? Is the internet down? Hopefully it's not. I mean, I still have access. This should populate instead of it saying pending. If I do this, no, it's not going to let me go forward until it finds it. What it does is it goes out and finds what's at that URL I just put in there. And it populates the window. You can see the window in here. This is what it's supposed to look like with developer tools that are at this address here. So if I got the address correct, I do. Gone OK. And let's try the HTTP instead of the HTTPS. Let's try that out. Actually, you know what? There's a problem here. Uh, let's try this again. Try the HTTP instead of HTTPS. Let's see. Actually, let's call this try number two. <laughs> so it's not called the same thing. Otherwise, it's going to give me a message. Try two. Okay, that's good. Anybody's working? Is anyone doing this right now? Is it working? Do you see those two options on your system? Yeah, that's what you're supposed to see. All right, so I will show you from using the this here. What you're supposed to see are two options or three options that show up here. Why mine is not working? I don't know. It could be uh, it could be that I'm not patient, pending, or that no, I have internet access. I'm good. This shouldn't say pending. This should populate with a couple of options. When it does, click on the. Oh, here it is now. Okay, I'm just not. I'm just not patient. Is what this is. <laughs> so, although I think it took a long time, personally, I don't know. I would just select the box. So my pending went away, and now it says developer tools on it. I would just select the entire box. If you press on the button to expand it, you'll see I want all of it. Am I really going to use the hierarchical viewer? Probably not. The trace viewer? Probably not. But I am going to use the DDMS and I am going to use the development tools. So I'm definitely going to want those options in there. But to make your life easier, because you don't know if you're going to use it or not, just install it anyway. Press next after you've clicked on the button there. And uh, there's nothing really much to do outside of than to wait at this point. And uh, we get to this screen here. And uh, we can review the details of what we want to install. And okay, it all looks good to me, so I'm going to go next. And then we have to say, uh, you know, accept the license agreement, the open source agreement that says, you know, do you agree to terms? And you're really supposed to read this thing. It's an Apache license, actually, um, because of the uh, emulators and stuff like that that's being used in here and all of the open source stuff. Yes, I agree. So you go next, or you just type in, or you click on finish. And then you get this installing software dialog box that comes up. Hopefully you've gotten to this point. I'm going to let this sit here for a few minutes and I go back to the README file just to make sure we're following everything correctly. This will walk you through with the screenshots to show you each one of the steps. I just kind of went through it myself. Um, so you download and install the, the, install the SDK um, by clicking on Next, clicking on Finish. 
When this is all done, we're going to want to restart Eclipse. We're going to do that because the menu options change. We get new items that appear on the menu when we restart Eclipse. If we don't restart it, we won't actually see it, which de definitely ends up being a problem eventually. There's also a folder on the disk that will save you some download effort. It's an Android folder, um, and we can take that or we can download it. There's a link here to get the more current one. If you have a live good connection right now, you might just want to start this download, actually. And what you're going to do is essentially go over or use the one on the CD-ROM. And uh, you're going to copy to from the CD-ROM, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. Or you're going to click on here. Let me, I'll just click on here because show you what I'm talking about. I don't know if my internet connection is going to be strong enough to actually bring up this site. Oh, it does. Look at that. In here, if you click on this, this is the URL that I put, took out of here for step number four, download and install the JD. Why do you want to do that? Well, you can get updates through the Eclipse system. And what, we installing, what we're installing in Eclipse is the browser plugin for Eclipse. There's two steps to it, and this is what causes everybody the most confusion. We also have to download and install the Android SDK. <laughs> you can do it all fresh from the plugin, or you can start with a base. This is the base. If you start with the base, there's less downloading that you have to do. <laughs> if you don't want to do this, you don't have to do this. You can install it all through the plugin, but it takes you a lot longer. Long story short. And plus, this kind of automates it a little bit easier for you. So you select the option here if you're on a Windows system on a 32 bit or on a, on, this is the installer, this is the zip file. If you go to the CD-ROM file, which I'm going to do because my download speed isn't the best, because back at uh, back in here I should have, oops, warning, you're installing, okay, press OK on the warning if you get that for unsigned software. Ah, so that's as good. So the newest plugin actually has a, a spot for you to restart. So I'm going to click on Restart Now, which will restart my Eclipse after the plugin got installed. So hopefully somebody in this room is going over this at the same time, hopefully, or similar. If not, you're going to do this at home later? I don't know. <laughs> or maybe you've done it already. <coughs> okay. Well, if anything failed, this is a good review to double check. So now we should have the plugin installed in Eclipse, but we don't have any of the SDKs yet because we just have the plugin. So if we go into File New, we're still not going to get anything. We go to Project. We're going to have Android here, and we're going to have Android Project, which is great. This is the plug-in functionality that was installed into Eclipse. It just allows us to create templated projects and sample projects and things using the SDK. But what we want to do now is click on the uh, window, and then we're going to see, unfortunately, I already have this installed. I, had the, I didn't remove Android, actually, and I probably shouldn't. But you may or may not see this yet on your menu. If you don't see it, what you want to do is go to the CD-ROM or go to this website, download the zip file, you take it off the CD-ROM. Here's the CD-ROM here. Let me show you what I'm talking about in the Windows directory. It's not on here. It is here. Android. It's just the 16-bit version is out there. If you have a 32-bit system, I think it's the same, actually. I think there's just one download. Go to the URL, download. What you're getting is the base packages for the Android SDK, not the plugin. This is completely 100% Android stuff. And I'll show you what that is in a few minutes. Take that, copy it onto your desktop, unzip it. Just like we installed Eclipse, it gets installed the same way. If you go into buy the um, Windows Explorer, click on my computer, click on the C drive. I think I put it in program files, and here it is, Android. If you put it in Android, <coughs> I basically renamed the folder Android, took off the dot whatever was on there, made it short. In here you're going to find all of the tools, just like how we're running Java through Eclipse, we're running this SDK package through Eclipse using the plugin. So it can be used with or without Eclipse. You can actually go to a DOS prompt and use Java C 
compile your programs. And include these packages and write Android programs without ever touching Eclipse if you wanted to. However, as we've seen, Eclipse is kind of a little bit easier in terms of the route to go. Uh, but this is where you're going to find all the packages. And what you're going to find here is the AVD Manager and the SDK Manager. One of them is for the Android Virtual Device, which is what AVD stands for, and the SDK is the SDK Manager Software Development Kit. You can run this here manually, or you can run it from Eclipse. I just double-clicked on it. <sighs> Nothing's coming up. Yep, here it is in the background. This window came up when I double-clicked on that file a few minutes ago. Let me close this so you can see what I'm talking about. This window came up, and now it's checking for updates and stuff like that. I double-clicked on the file that was in my Windows Explorer directory that from my Android. It was actually in the main folder for Android. If I want, what I can do is use Eclipse to do that. And if I go into the window and click on AVD Manager or SDK Manager, those are those two files. It's just nothing more than a menu item. If I click, look at that, it's the same screen. <laughs> All Eclipse is doing is running from that Android directory that you have in there. It's running that stuff. So if you don't have that stuff in there, you skip that step, none of this stuff's going to work. It's like trying to run Eclipse without installing Java. It's not going to compile anything because there's no compiler on your system. So, in fact, a lot of people do that. They install um, Eclipse uh, for Java developers, and they don't install Java. And then they try and go, oh, compile, run. And nothing happens because you know, there's no Java compiler on there. Anyway, long story short, this is running the AVD manager. What do you want to need from the AVD, excuse me, the SDK manager? The SDK manager is going to show you what's installed. Let me make this a little bit bigger. And let me tell you what it is you probably want. This will take a few minutes because it's going out to the internet. It's checking for updates for me. Um, and yours is probably going to be end up doing the same thing. You are probably going to want, in fact, if you look in the status, you can see what I've got installed so far. This is the long time consuming part, which is why I wanted to start this at the beginning of class before I started talking about Android, <laughs> so that you guys can be downloading this while I'm lecturing. But, um, oh, install for packages. Um, what, there's an update, looks like, here. So, what we're looking at on the top are the basic tools. So, let me, let me explain the SDK to you for a second or two. I actually didn't go into this much detail during the workshop, so this is new information for those of you who may have attended the workshop. The tools are the base utilities. The tools are the DDMS manager, the debugger, the debug tool, the kernel build tools, all of the things that are associated with the SDK. And these are the tools that are not usually run via Eclipse, but things like the DDMS, and I'll show you that today as well, that does run from Eclipse. But... 90% of it's run from the DOS prompt. You'll probably never see it. But you need the tools. Because if you don't have the tools, you're going to run into a situation where you're going to you know, need to use it for something, and you're not going to find it, and you have to go back through. So if you're here anyway, install it. <laughs> so um, if something is, says like, for example, in fact, I'm going to do the update while I'm talking to you because I have two partitions here. I can let this run. Uh, but on here, I've clicked on, uh, or it clicked on it for me automatically, actually. What I've got now is, uh, uh, this one here is going to be updated. Biggest problem is trying to figure out, well, what SDK do I need to install? And uh, here's the differences, and let me just make this a little smaller so you can actually see what this window is actually doing. Uh, outside of the tools, the rest of it sort of reads like Greek. And I can kind of see what's going on here in terms of the API levels. So the API levels are different from the Android versions, which is kind of interesting. And we have different Android versions that run with different APIs. If you're going to develop, you're going to want to have a lot of different choices. Because sometimes it will work on one API level, but it won't work on another. Because something has changed. Because either the library that you're using or the source code example that you're using is based on a previous API. They give us sort of like operating systems. If you wrote a program for Windows ME, is it going to work on Windows 7? Uh, maybe. If you wrote a program for Windows 7, is it going to work on Windows ME? Uh, probably not. <laughs> so, but when you're testing, are you going to want all those? Yeah. If you're going to use those, you're going to want them. So take the time now or take the time later when you get home. Open up this screen. Install everything. And install as much as you can. If you don't want to install everything, pick 4.0, which is the most current, 
API level. Actually, we're up to 17 right now. So this is actually kind of old. Um, I think we're up to 17. I'm not sure right now. Uh, 15 seems. Hmm, I might be thinking about. I might be thinking about something else. But pick something that's new. Don't go back any lower than 2.2. 2.3. And 3.0, these are really good API levels. They're pretty solid at this point. All the bugs are worked out. A lot of source code examples are using these. Here's what the problem is. You got books floating around, right? There's a website that you can download the examples for that book off of. The books are all 3.0. <laughs> the books aren't going to work very nicely. In, uh, the other, You're going to get errors all over the place. If you want to work, all you have to do is when you make the project, select which API. And let me show you that real quick because then this might make a little bit more sense to you. If I'm out here in Eclipse, oops, I can't do that without closing that window. Well, let me close the window for a second. Oops, hello. How did I get to us? Here it is. Well, I'll show you that in a few minutes, because when I close the window and I bring it back up again, it's going to go through a bunch of stuff all over again. But long story short, when you create the project, you can select which API you want to use, and the API level is going to be for the different operating system level, all the way from what, you know, whatever you've installed, all the way through whatever you've installed. So if you haven't in anything installed, you can't make any project types of anything. So when you specify the project type, whatever you select here is going to be the options that are available to you. So, and some of these options you're going to find, and we're going to look at this in a few minutes, VirtualBox, you're going to find emulators that work with some of the options that don't work with some of the other options. So get a, get a variety is what I'm saying. What else do you need? You want the samples. So what I have highlighted here, and it looks like a little beaker, little samples. These are the samples that are on android.developer.com or developer.android.com that website I showed you on Monday. These are the examples, but they're built in to the SDK. So here, if I select this, it's already installed, actually, over here. I don't have to worry about it. Um, you don't need the ARM. You don't need, um, you don't need anything else that might be listed here uh, that are end up being other options. I would select Google APIs. And uh, the Google APIs are going to give you the features for mapping uh, for any of the Google Talk interface, Google Voice interface stuff, uh, any of the Google tools or special APIs, you're going to need to run in the project with the Google support. So you'll need to select that for the project type. And I'll show you that as we go through the course. If you ever run into an issue where you're following an example and it says select the Google product and you don't see that, come back here refresh your system, update your system, install what you need. Most likely you don't have it installed is what the issue is. Um, it's usually nine times out of ten the problem is you don't have the right SDK installed. So select options and here I'm going to actually I'm, I'm going to update my system actually. Uh, nah, I'm not going to update the system because it's going to run too slowly. But after you've installed those items, so what you would do is uh, click on the items you want, press install, if you follow through the, uh, the readme doc here, you uh, click on the items, you press install. Um, the next thing you're going to do is configure Eclipse to use the Android SDK, which is what we've done. Sometimes you might actually end up with a prompt that comes up that says, um, you know, where, where are, you know, if you go into, as an example, the Windows directory, and there's a pr preferences down here. Preferences in the Android category, if you click on Android, I have this directory here. You may or may not, depending upon this, I, I can't show you the prompt because I don't have it, uh, I've already have the Android tools installed. You may or may not get a prompt. It's looking for that directory. When you, and it's just going to happen when you first go into or you exit out of the SDK manager. Um, it's going to eventually throw up a little prompt, or it might set it for you automatically. Um, depending upon which, if it can find it. If you're having problems running it and you're getting some strange error messages or the SDK manager is not loading for you at all, go into the window, click on preferences, make sure you have the correct directory set up for the base APIs that you've installed, hopefully. And if you haven't done that, 
and that's the problem right there. If I do that, I can see what I have installed. And in this particular system, I have 2.33, 4.0, and 4.03 installed, which are my API levels 10 through 15, which is the current stuff, actually. I'm probably not going to do anything past 2.7, so 2.33 is fine. Um, may, you may not actually even see any. You know, I might just see 4.0 here. What you see in the window is what you've installed in the SDK Manager. If you haven't installed anything yet, you're not going to see anything in here yet. I wouldn't play around with the settings. I would leave all of the built stuff the same. All of these I would leave at the same settings because the defaults pretty much work on 99.9% .9 of all systems. The only thing you're going to need to change is the SDK location if it's not set. It's, and you most likely you're going to get a prompt for it. It's going to ask you for the SDK location. So back at the ranch, I've gone through it, I've installed, hopefully. Hopefully you're doing that right now, perhaps. Anybody have any questions before I continue forward? No? Yeah? Oh, that's fine. That's fine. You take that one. I think I have that one, actually. 4.0.9. Let me show you how those are being used while your stuff is downloading. If I go File, New, and... Oh, this is good. So it's in here, but some systems, okay, for example, here, this is the interesting thing, and I noticed this during the workshop, actually. If I go File New, I see Java Project, and I see Project. If I click on Project, then I get Android down here. On my Mac system, I actually, which is an older, and I'm not going to touch it because it's working just fine. If I go File, New, I see Android Project. <laughs> Some people have actually said, and I've seen screens of the current one. In fact, you said you have it, don't you? Or no? Some people yeah. actually have Android Project. You don't have Android Project? Some of the screens do. Some of them don't. Um, it's a weird, really weird thing. It depends on which plugin you have with which version of Eclipse and whether it was set correctly. One person told me it wasn't there originally. They turned their computer off, they turned it back on, and now it's there. So I want to say that it's a little buggy. The plugin is a bit buggy. So you may or don't, don't be panicked if you don't see Android Project. And I can't figure out, I can't tell you, I haven't figured out how to get it on there manually. But I can tell you some people have it on there, some people don't have it on there. And on my Windows side, I just noticed I don't have it on there. It doesn't matter, I can still create an Android Project. So the way you create an Android project, and I'm going to move ahead a little bit here only so I can show you how the SDK fits into this big picture, is uh, I've gone into File, New. I don't see Android anywhere, so I'm going to go into Project. And as the project type, and here's the other thing too, so you can go to different sites using that same technique I just showed you by cutting and pasting a URL in there or typing it in. We went to the Google site. You can go into other ones and install plugins for Oracle, plugins for um, all sorts of different development languages and stuff. So Eclipse can be used for like PHP programming, Perl programming, um, all sorts of different stuff. And that's how you get things installed into Eclipse. And you get the you know plugin support and stuff like that. It creates menu options for you. So if I say Android project, I'm going to get a base empty Hello World project. That's not going to do anything for me. If I go Android Sample Project, if you remember where I said click on that one that says Samples next to it, <laughs> those are the samples. There's like a half a dozen of them, maybe a dozen or so of them. And those samples are the ones that are out on the developer website. So if you go out here and go um, developer, there we go. You go out to the developer site. And uh, you click on resources. Ooh, this is interesting. There we go. And uh, sample code. Uh, there's a menu option over here, but I also see it here. If I click on sample code, it's going to have a basic training. A long ways down the menu option. Actually, here it is here. They moved us around a little bit. They used to have a link over here for it. They probably still do if I looked for it a little bit longer. This accelerometer play, action bar, compatibility, all these things are the samples that you're selecting with that plugin in Eclipse. So you don't have to download these examples. You don't have to do work with the site at all. The site is integrated into those sample options. And I'll show you. Actually, here's accelerometer play, whatever. If I go 
in here and go next. <clears throat> if I click on, uh, I'm just going to use 4.03 as an example because I believe that's what I had on here. Here's the, the first one on the item. You can see that. That's what I saw on that website a few minutes ago. The first project, that's the project. So I don't have to download anything. And it integrates, believe it or not, all the documentation as well. So you can get everything that's on developer.android, you can get through the Eclipse system as well, which is kind of interesting. A lot of people don't know that. You download those examples all the time. It's like, why well, download it? It's a zip file, and then you have to figure out which API version is it for. Here's the other trick. <coughs> so I selected 4.03 as the API version. When if I want to run it on a previous one, I can get the examples for 2.33. I only have these three installed. This is why I say you want to install a lot, because then you have more examples you can pick out of, more APIs you can pick out of, in terms of, and they're all pretty much the same, like here it is the same example. But this one is now coming from the 2.33. The Android, developer Android website only has the current ones on there. It doesn't have any of the back ones. So you can't get 2.33 from that website. You can only get it through the, through, through the browser plugin. You're wondering, well, why do I want it? <laughs> I'm going to show you in a few minutes. Emulators support different API levels. And everything is backward compatible, but it's not forward compatible. If I run an ice cream version on a 2.33 system, it's going to crash and burn on me. And I'm going to go, I can't test this thing. Because I don't have an emulator that I like that runs with 4.0. And then I have a 2.3 emulator. Let me talk about emulators for a second. As I mentioned in the um, in the workshop, I'm not a fan of the emulators uh, because they run very slowly, and I'm not going to attempt to actually run the emulator. But let me show you how the project actually uses it. It's through the AVD manager, and the AVD manager is the other option on the window. And if I click on the AVD manager. And it looks like I've already previously created um, a couple of emulators, but I'll, I'll create a new one here. You click on new because your, your screen is probably going to be empty. I'll create, I don't have a 2.3 one, so I'm going to create AVD 2.3. I label the name of the AVDs, which stands for the Android Virtual Device, which is the emulator. I label it the same name as the version, the API, because you need that. Because if you're running a 4.0, you got to run it on a 4x, 4. something compatible emulator. It's not going to run on the 2.3 or the 3.8. If I call them emulator 1, emulator 2, emulator, I'm not going to know what version of emulator that is. It's not going to tell me. Uh, so the drop down list is going to tell me what's available. So I'm going to say 2.3. I'm going to do like this. If I want to be, you know, save myself some work in the, in the future, I can just do that. Create. You can add uh, SD card support to the emulators. You can add memory to the emulators. You can configure the emulators. So if I click on the emulator here and I go into edit, click on the edit menu, this is the same window or similar window that I had originally. Um, but in here, this is where I would specify what's it? It's, this is a virtual SD card. So it mimics, the emulator is mimicking, um, you know, if I, mostly good, you know, 512 is pretty good. 512 in here. I can have it use a file instead if I want. Uh, so it reads and writes to a SD file that's not a... This is... I actually probably don't want to do that because it's going to reserve memory on my system and partition it as a... It's going to basically make a little partition and call it a card to simulate it. And I don't like to use these emulators anyway, so... I can change the screen here, the skin. I can change the resolution of the emulator. And the hardware support for the emulator. The other options that you had in that window that I said don't select this, don't select that, this stuff here. Let me go back to this real quick because it, it does definitely merit some explanation and it's going to load. This ARM as an example, it's for a different, we actually have an ARM emulator. It's for a different hardware platform that you can develop for. It's not necessarily an Android or Google phone. It's going to be a proprietary. You can add, as I say, you know, when you put that URL in, we went to the DL, the download site for Google for the, the, these APIs, you can add other ones in there. So 
you have a Samsung device or something like that, you want to have a Samsung proprietary emulator support with the SDK and all the toolkits that come with this hardware that doesn't exist on the standard Google product or whatever, you essentially get it the same way, you go through the same process. You have to install it. This is going to give me an error because I don't have, there's no support for it. There's no, I don't have, I'm not ever going to test with it, so I'm not going to install it. Further down here, we're going to see, oops, it's not going to be on here because I don't have it installed. I'm not installed. Uh, as we go through the different API versions, there are some differences between the different proprietary hardwares that's on here. Um, the only ones I'm seeing right now look the same, but there's some different models, different uh, options as you get. A lot of them, I think, are in the lower, but I don't have it all installed, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mess with it. But you're not gonna mess with it either. either. But you can actually create different emulator types for those different devices because the emulator has to match the SDK that you're working with. So to run the emulators, after you've installed the SDK, after you've installed, created an AVD, let's just run. I'm just gonna run through a Hello World project right now, actually, and show you the default emulator. If it loads, it may not load. And then show you VirtualBox, which is the option you're probably going to want to use for this class and probably going to want to use in the future. So if I just create a standard Android project and I go next and I give it a project name like Hello World. Hello World. And I go next. This is where it gets in. You're picking a target build. You're picking the API level, which is why I say you want to you have a good selection to pick from. I'm just going to go 2.33 because I like that one. Next, and then give it a package name. And on uh, Monday, we will build a project from scratch, and we'll go through the package names and everything. Tonight, it's just basically getting through the install and getting oriented with the system. It's kind of a, sort of a repeat of the workshop, but I need to do that in the beginning for people who didn't attend the workshop. Um, the package name, I'm just going to call it, you know, uh, the pack, okay, so this will help you in the object-oriented programming in Java course as well. Packages is sort of like a directory name. In the old days, it's the URL in reverse. So if we were at www.itu.edu, it would be edu.itu.ww, but people leave off the www. So if you've ever wondered how package names get created, it's, it's the URL backwards. So, so in this class, I'm always going to go edu, itu, and then I'm going to call it, you know, hello or something. <laughs> and what are the dots? So the subdirectories. So theoretically, we're traversing through a directory structure, and this is storing, and it does store actually. In the project, it stores per that directory structure. So we can put different class files in different folders, different locations within the package, and then we can mix and match different packages, add stuff to different packages. I can create five projects and put it all in the same package if I want to, and use different files from the same package within the package. So. I'll talk about packages um, a little bit more as we get through the course. But uh, what I just did was created a sample project for you, um, and uh, what I've got now is, and if you were here for the Java class and you saw the sample project that was created for Java, not all this stuff was there. <laughs> the only thing we had in there was a SRS SRC directory source directory, and then we had. Instead of Android 2.33, we had Java something, it says in there. So because the package is a different content because we have the support for the Android SDK that's included. And we also have the other components. So another thing I'm going to do tonight is go through the, the package, or essentially the, the project, excuse me, what's involved. If I open up the source directory, I see this package name that I gave it. And everything is going to be inside of the package name. And I have a hello world activity. And the hello world activity, if I double click on it. See on the Mac, when you click on it, it opens up automatically for you. Windows, you got to double click on it, which is kind of weird. I keep forgetting I'm on a Windows system. <laughs> so <coughs> you see sort of a sort of a similar format. We can this is why I say it's, it's good to take both of these classes together, object-oriented programming, Java, and then Android, because you see this is sort of similar, except for it's a little bit different. So what I'm going to be doing on Monday, after you guys, because you need a system together, and hopefully we'll have tables in here, and hopefully we'll be able to work on this stuff while I'm talking to you. We'll be creating classes just like we're doing in the Java class, <coughs> except for we have these things like on create methods, which is essentially a main. 
and we have slightly different syntax for the components. As an example, we have hello world activity, which is a class that actually has a main in it, young create, which is sort of the starting point or the main equivalence. We can also create other classes and make instances of those classes inside of this particular class and use it. So it's the same tool set, it's the same programming technique, but it's done in a slightly different fashion to accommodate for the SDK and for the environment. But in order for me to teach you that, I'm going to have to go through, well, what is this environment? <laughs> what is the life cycle of the application? Because it's different. It runs in a single process instead of multiple processes. And there's an actual life cycle to the starting and the ending. And sometimes the application starts and it doesn't end. It just sits there on the phone. Have you ever had applications where you've clicked on it and you've switched to other applications and you've switched to... You know, you've checked notifications, you've checked email. Oh, yeah, look at that. LinkedIn is still over there. You know, and you, you come back to certain things. The life cycle, that's describing, or it's a symptom of the life cycle that doesn't end when you open and close something. The Java projects that you create for a computer, open and close. You know, they don't, usually they don't hang out in the background. And usually they work with multiple processes instead of just one process. So the programming technique is similar, but it's a little different to accommodate for the different platform. That's the only way I can describe it. So <clears throat> long story short, we have the same structures we saw earlier tonight, except for a few different method calls. And unfortunately, with Android, we start out with inheritance on day number one. <laughs> we start extending. The word extends, what we're going to find out in the Java class, is inheritance. And right from the day number one, from hello world, we have to extend from activity. We don't actually always have to extend activity. There's like five or six different options we can extend from. But we're inheriting right from day one. So it merits a little bit more discussion in the beginning before we start programming in terms of the style. But uh, the reason why I created this project is I'm trying to show you the emulator. So we have this project that has this class. The class will run. When we run the class, let me just close it so you can kind of see what's going on here. If I were to run it as a Java program and I had output, we would see the output show up down here on the bottom of the screen. And on Monday, we'll see output show up on the bottom of the screen in the Java class if you're taking that. For Android, we can't see output, unfortunately. Instead, we have to send it to an emulator. The Eclipse plugin connects the emulator to the project, and we assign the emulator to the project. And we do that when we run the project. So until you run the project, you can't put the pieces together. So, and I'll show you, this makes more sense when you start seeing the virtual box emulators as well. If I go run, and then I go run as, I can't do that, can I? I have to click on the project. You have to click on the project in order to get the right options here. If you right mouse click, or if you select the option up here, run. On the bottom of the screen here, and I'll talk about JUnit in this course as well. I can run this thing as a Java application. Those were the options I had before. Unfortunately, this is on the bottom of my screen. Let me see if I can get this scrolling. Oh, there we go. Scroll down a little bit here so you can see it. These are the options I'm talking about. If I try and run it as a Java application, it's going to tell me there's no main. Same thing we had with the pencil class earlier today, actually. It's going to give me the same error message because this is Java code and it's compilable and it runs with the same JVM on the same computer but we're going to run it through the emulator aka phone instead of running it uh, on the computer which is why we say Android application Android app actually works with uh, a unit testing program called JUnit which works with Java as well so you don't you know some people have actually have experience with JUnit and never heard of Android or never have worked with JUnit because it's not the two of them don't run together. Jana is a unit testing program that automatically creates test cases for your classes. And we'll see JUnit in this class as well as the object-oriented programming class. It's a nice utility for testing. It's just done for unit testing. Don't have any JUnit tests created, so I'm not going to do it. You can also generate Java docs and do a bunch of other stuff through Eclipse. But I'm going to select Android application, and I've selected that. It says launching Hello World down the bottom of the screen. And... It should ask me for an emulator selection, and it didn't. Instead, it picked the emulator automatically. And this is what our emulator looks like. 
And I will warn you ahead of time that this I mean, these boxes screens will show up, and eventually this Hello World application will run on this program, hopefully. So what ends up happening is after you've done this about two or three times, you decide this is way too slow. This will probably take, because I'm running this in a virtual machine on top of a Windows machine, and the virtual machine is an emulator in itself. I'm running an emulator on top of an emulator. I'm going to say about 15 minutes from now, this might actually populate with the program. It's too long for me. I can't do it. Even if I run it on my Mac partition, it's going to take five minutes, ten minutes, maybe not as long, maybe half of the amount, but it's still not acceptable for me. So here's what everybody does, and not everybody, but everyone who, who wants to do this, who's impatient, who wants to do this quickly. There's a program called VirtualBox. And let's take a look at that. I'm going to close this window because I don't want to wait for it to come up. And I'm going to close Eclipse right now as well because I don't need Eclipse for this either. Uh, I'm going to close this guy too. Actually, I'm going to open this. This is in the README file. We also have the instructions for VirtualBox. So you can optionally install what is virtual. It's a, it's a, actually VirtualBox is comparable to Windows Parallels, Parallel Desktop. Parallels Desktop is what I'm running that I'm running Windows inside of right now. And you can use VirtualBox to install Windows on a MacBook actually as well. Because um, essentially this is an emulator that I'm running. So VirtualBox, if you click on the link here, it may or may not be on the CD-ROM. If you want the files, I have them here. I can put them on a USB disk for you. Or you can click on the link. Just probably you'll, you'll get the most recent up-to-date VirtualBox install. If you click on the link or bring it up into your web browser and go to VirtualBox, there's two things you need. There's the emulation software. VirtualBox works on the Windows and also on Mac. And when you go into the VirtualBox download for the binaries, you don't need the source code. All you need is the binaries for it. Here's uh, Linux-based computers. If you can see here on the side, uh, Windows hosts for the platform packages, or you can see um, you know, the, the OS X Mountain Lion versions of it for Mac, extension packs for it. What you want to do is, in fact, this is the download actually for it. The Windows host here is the one you want if you're on a Windows machine. I think I actually have this in, an, it's this one is, uh, let me just save this one anyway. But this might take too long. But let's see, I have this actually saved already, so I don't have to worry about downloading it. Yeah, it's going to take too long. Yours download is going to take about 10 or 15 minutes. I'm impatient, so I've already downloaded it. If somebody wants this, I can go ahead and give it to you. I can put it on a USB disk. I'll probably wait till the class is over with, but uh, you can get it. Um, but I want to show you the install is actually kind of, this is one, okay, so this is 4.1.10. The one I just looked at was 4.1.14, so they made some modifications to it. VirtualBox, when you install it, and I'll just run through the install real quick so you can sort of see what I'm talking about. It's the same, same screen, same prompts for a Windows versus a Mac. Double-clicked on it, but nothing's happening. Here we go. This will be interesting because I'm installing a virtual box inside of a virtual box. <laughs> so this is going to run on the slow side. It's going to run a lot faster for you. It runs a lot faster on my Mac partition when I'm not running it inside of a virtual machine. So this is an Oracle VM. It's actually made by Oracle. Um, you want to select all of the options. Just use the defaults for everything. Once you do that, you can create the shortcut, you can create everything. It's actually pretty simple. There's a warning, there's a network interface. Okay, yeah, whatever. I'm going to press install. The install runs like within seconds, but you really haven't done anything. <laughs> You've installed the virtual machine. The trick is to get the right emulator to run in the virtual machine. So here's the difference. So I have Parallels Desktop Software. And I've installed Microsoft Windows inside of the Parallels desktop software. I can tell, take and install Microsoft Windows inside of my VirtualBox, but I don't really want two versions of Windows. I want the Android SDK. I want the Android emulator. So what they've done is the community out there has created ports for the Android operating system that runs on Intel processors instead of Android devices. So it's made for PCs. 
and it's made to be run as emulators. And so if you go out to the so let's just cancel, let's just leave this alone. There's a link here to download Android x86 ports, the ISO image. If I copy this, put it into my web browser. Go in here, I see 2.2 R3s. I see most of them are old. Why? Because you have to actually take the operating system, which we haven't really learned about yet. It's a Linux-based operating system. And build a proprietary, not a proprietary, it's a kernel. You're building the kernel for the OS based upon the kernel code and the OS code that's available. So are they really going to release 4.0 tomorrow? I mean, out to the SDK people? No, it's a slow process. So most of your emulators are from 2.8. There's a lot of threes. Actually, I have a four. You can get the fours. You can get the threes. They're a little bit buggy. The 2.3s are really solid. Those emulators are nice. What you're downloading is an ISO file. The ISO file, you can actually burn to a disk, stick the disk in your computer, and load the emulator to run on your computer. In fact, if you have one of those cheesy little netbook things, those, um, who makes those things? Um, they're like $200 to a little itsy bitsy little netbook. Um, let me a mind blank here. Um, they're like the cheapest notebook on the market. Netbook? Yeah, what, what, what is the brand of that thing? Um, it's like some cheesy brand too. Um, net something like EEP, like EPCs. There's ports for EEPC. It's probably in here somewhere. ASUS. Here's. Um, let me make this a little bigger so you can see it. These ports. You can actually install this on. You can go to Fry's, buy one of those, or go on Craigslist, buy one of those cheesy netbook things. Burn the disk. Put the ISO on it. Burn it to a disk. Take the disk. Boot the system up with it. And install it, and then you have an Android computer running. It's just like installing Windows, essentially. But you're taking Windows off. Kind of dangerous. Do it to a $200 computer instead if you want that. It's not really an emulator, though. It's instead you've created a computer, right? So what you do with the emulator, these ISOs have two modes to them. So the mode to it is to install it or to run it. And there's a boot menu that comes up, and we'll see that in a few minutes. You don't even have to install it. You just download the ISO. You put it into a directory. You attach it to the emulator. The emulator boots the ISO image as if you were to put it in on a CD-ROM drive. You don't have to burn it at all. And you're in, you run that in an, what, I'm, what I'm calling the emulation mode. And we'll see how that works in a few minutes. Um, but um, ASUS, EE, EPCs are the ones. Actually, there's some for HP computers in here, too. But uh, there's a couple of links that you can uh, download from and the links are listed in the readme file that I gave you on that disk at the end of the readme file. You see these links here? The ones that I have found that I like I can actually give you as well if you want. Um, I have, if you have a USB, oh, this one finished, okay good. So I installed the emulator. Um, there's a couple of, uh, how did I get test in here? Hmm. Yeah, that may have been left over. Uh, let's see, Indigo, here it is. This is the uh, ISO image, the generic one that I downloaded um, that works pretty well, actually, that you can attach. And I'm, I'm going to leave it in here in the workshop directory. I'm going to connect it. I'm going to show you how to run this ISO image from VirtualBox. So VirtualBox is a program that runs, and let me close it so you can actually see what's going on here. I installed it. I waited. I clicked on finish. I have this little icon down here on the bottom of the screen. It looks like a Looks like a it's Oracle Virtual Box. On my MacBook, it looks like this. It's the same icon. So, when you load up the icon, it loads up the main screen. This must have must have been left over, so I'm just going to delete this sucker. I'll remove. Uh, eh, remove only. I can delete the files because the files are probably linked linked to my workspace directory. So, when you bring up Virtual Box, it looks like that, and you say, "Well, what do I do with that?" Well, that's where these ISO images come into place. So you download the ISO image for the emulator that you would like to use. And what's the emulator? What's well, going to be a 4.0, a 3.0, a 2.0? Pick an emulator, any emulator. 
You want to make sure you pick a generic one, not one that's built for EPC or HP or something, because it's not going to run because you don't have, unless you have that hardware, then you can actually run it. But the generic ones work just fine. If you're looking for one, I can give you it. I have it. I can put it on a disk for you. Click on New. What we're going to do is create a new operating system slash, you know, emulator. Uh, so we're going to go next. And uh, so I'm going to give it a name. And uh, the name I'm going to call, I'm going to just call it Test. That sounds pretty good. And it's going to ask you, well, is this a Windows? Because it can install Windows in here. And this is how I'm going to create a new operating system that's going to show up in the menu. But I'm going to click on the operating system, and it's going to start my emulator. Because I still have to start the emulator in order for it to work. It's kind of like the difference between my Mac partition and my Windows partition here. I'm going to talk between the two different partitions eventually. Uh, but I'm going to do it between VirtualBox and the other partition, if that makes any sense. So I'm going to select Linux, and you want to select Linux as the operating system type, and you want to select 2.6 because it's generic. Because as I mentioned before, Android is a 2.6 operating system. Uh, it's 2.6-ish, sort of. It's a Linux build. Android is a Linux operating system. Um, 2.6 works pretty good. Um, I've also found the Debian actually works pretty good, too, or Ubuntu actually works as well. So it doesn't really matter if you pick the wrong one. Um, either one of them will work. What this will do is, you know, reserve the right amount of space and create the right amount of environment. So I'm going to click Next. And specify how much memory I want to use for this emulator. I'm just going to leave it on the defaults. The more memory you give the emulator, the slower the rest of the computer runs. So you don't want to give it too much memory. But if you're focusing and you're just running the emulator, then you want to give it a lot of memory. So for the startup disk, this is where I can create an external hard drive or virtual hard drive if I want. Or I can use the ISO image. I'm not going to, I'm just going to say use existing hard drive. And uh, this was created, I believe this may have been created the last time I did this, which is kind of ridiculous because the partition's still there. So it doesn't look like it removed it, actually. Um, if you're creating a new hard drive, do a very small hard drive because you're not going to use it. You're going to boot the system. You're going to boot the emulator with this ISO disk. It's like the ISO disk is a replacement for a CD-ROM. It's a virtual CD-ROM, and you're not going to use the hard drive space. And it doesn't do the same thing as an SD card either. It's wasted space on your computer that you're not going to bother with. So. Um, you can, it, I, actually I'm not going to create the hard drive space, but you can select hard drive type as a virtual hard disk. Um, I believe I already have one on here, which is why. It's, uh, mm, let's just go down here. Nothing. Four megabytes. There we go. Well, I'm going to delete it anyway. Mm, it's not going to like four megabytes. All right. See if that'll take it. No. All right, let me go back here. I want to get rid of this hard disk option. Well, it's on my Windows partition, which is why I didn't want to do this. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll leave it here. Actually, here, I'll make it down to four. One gig. There we go. All right, in essence, uh, I uh, selected the wrong option, so it wanted me to create that hard disk. And if you do that, don't make one for four eight gigs. Make it one gig or less, you know, 512. Make it very small because you're not going to use it for anything. Click on Create. Failed to create the new virtual disk. OK. Uh, probably because of the hard disk issue. Uh, let me just take a little quick look here. Let me cancel this for a second and do it correctly. Testing. One more time, make sure I have this correct. Create new hard disk, let's just do it this way. I was trying to use a, an existing one, it wasn't really. A uh, virtual hard disk, I guess I'll just create one. Dynamically size. Let's go down to one gig. Okay, that time it worked. I have to go back in and delete it because I don't want that. But uh, if you create one virtual disk, make it a gig, 500 something, and use the same one. Select that same one over and over again for as many emulators as you put in here. You're conserving disk space. Um, now I'm not going to use this, but eventually, 
have to delete it. So, All right, so what I have now is this testing um, emulator. So if I double click on it, nothing's really going to happen. It's going to open up. It's going to try and boot something, but it's not attached to anything. There's nothing here. So I had to change the settings to actually make it work um, and perform something. So I'm going to close out of here. And I'm going to make it boot to the CD-ROM drive. And the CD-ROM drive is going to have that ISO image in it. So I'm going to, through the settings, attach the ISO image to the CD-ROM drive so I can boot it. Um, I do that by clicking on the emulator that I have, hit settings, go into storage, and you see that the, I have an IDE controller that has a CD DVD drive. This is a virtual everything. So I'm pretending as if I have a CD-ROM drive on my virtual box that's going to run in my emulator that's going to boot my image. So it's not very intuitive, but if you click on the little thing here, it looks like a disk, actually. And you say choose virtual CD DVD. This is where I'm going to click on a workspace uh, extras, and I'm going to go into this one here that I have on my desktop. Make sure you keep this wherever location you put it. So this is a really bad example because I'm not going to keep this on my desktop, but I'm not going to keep this emulator running. Uh, but I've done this because I want to uh, demo it too. But copy this like into your C drive or something and don't move it. You still need the ISO because it's going to boot the ISO as if it's a virtual disk. So you select OK. If you go into general, you can change around some of the settings here in terms of uh, you know the basic system startup and stuff like that, the memory that's associated with it. Under system, I'm going to change the boot order just to boot to the CD-ROM drive. By default, it will actually boot to the CD-ROM drive. It's like an old computer. It's like taking, an, it, it's simulating a really old style computer where you would just boot to the CD and without a hard disk. So I'm going to say OK on here because I've selected the boot order I've, on the storage. I've got the disk in here and I can see the disk as an option now. I can add more disks to it. I can run the same emulator with different disks by just switching the disk if I wanted to. But why? Why bother? Uh, so I can see I've got the right one here, so I'm going to go OK. Now when I click on Start, or I double click on this here, I should just double click on it, it says Starting. It should bring up, this is an emulator inside of an emulator, by the way, so this is going to run a little bit slower. I might have to load up my emulator that's not running inside of an emulator. Oh, but it actually loaded pretty fast. This is going to give me a warning about the memory optimal working space of 32-bit color. Well, okay, I'm not going to worry about the screen resolution. But you remember those old Linux disks? You know, you burned when you stuck in your drive and you booted your system up and you got a grub menu? That's the grub menu. <laughs> so it's like an old-style Linux boot. You can actually modify, you can install, so you can run the emulator without an installation. You can install the emulator into your hard disk space that you created, that one gigabyte. I'm not going to bother. Why bother? I'm not going to change anything in the emulator. I have one emulator, however, that I did create on my Mac partition that I did install into the hard drive. It runs a little bit faster, and I can keep stuff there. So I've archived different builds of different things and you can save. It's just like having Windows on my MacBook. Actually, I have an Android system on my MacBook as well where I can run stuff, install stuff, save it, and I don't have to keep rebooting. every. You know, I don't have to like start fresh every time I go to it. But then I have other emulators that I just run from the ISO because why bother? So I'm just going to run this one, and I'm going to run it in Versa mode on my computer, which works great on a MacBook. On some other computers, Mm, guru meditation. Okay, perfect. Let's just ignore this. <laughs> I might have to load up the emulator in another. On my, it, it may not necessarily run in this partition, so because I have recording software running and then I have an emulator running inside of an emulator, so I might have to stop this for a second. I believe it is frozen. Yes. I have successively frozen my Windows partition. All right, before it freezes my entire computer, however, I'm going to go and continue the demo on the Mac partition, where I know the emulator is going to work. So I'm going to quit this. Oh, it quit. Nice, very nice. All right. 
So you've seen the install on a Windows partition. The install on the Mac is identical. The concept is identical. You take the ISO image, I copy it into and I'll show you where my ISO images are located. One moment. I'm going to shut down this as well. I've put them in my home directory, so out here. Uh, actually, I put them in the workspace directory, I believe. Nope, I have actually have them in the home directory. Yep, here it is here. These are the one, two, three, four. Actually, I've got five of them in here. Five emulators. They're just ISO files. When I go to VirtualBox, which is the same interface on the Mac as it is on the Windows machine, I've got one, two, three, four, five emulators. These are the ISO files that I have stored there. If you remove the ISO files accidentally, toast. <laughs> you have to recreate it because, or re-download the file and re restore it, put it back where it was because it's not going to load. Well, let me run the emulator for you so you can see what I'm talking about. I'm going to run, uh, this, is, this is the emulator actually that I was running, uh, the 2.2 version I believe. If I press start, it's going to bring up that boot menu, same as before, but this time it's actually going to work. There we go. And it boots just as if I put the disk in the computer. And if you get the right disk for the right hardware on the computer, you put the disk in, you'll get this booting on the computer, actually, which is really cool. And people install this, those EPCs and stuff. But you might notice that this is running a bit faster, actually. Uh, maybe you haven't noticed. I don't know. Uh, but on average, these emulators run about twice as fast as the Android emulators. Um, the interesting part, however, is that you load the emulator before you load the Eclipse project. So what I'm going to do is demo how to connect Eclipse with the VirtualBox, which isn't that bad. It's not that hard. Oh, this is an older one. Okay. So I'm going to disable the mouse integration down here. So what I have now is a full-featured Android system, you know, as if I had an Android device. And I can, you know, click in here in the middle and run applications, install applications. I have internet access through here. I can go to the web browser. And it's a full, it's a full emulator. So, actually, I can go itu.edu. Here we got the website. Oh, ITU Mobile. That's cool. So we have full internet access, full support. Doesn't support Bluetooth doesn't support some proprietary hardware that might be on a special Android phone, something of that nature, um, that you're using. So what I've done is I've created different emulator versions, just like the AVD manager, creating different emulators for the AVG, AVD. If I go into Eclipse now, there's one, it's not an annoying step, but there's one step you have to do to connect the emulator to Eclipse. You have to do it every time you reboot the computer. And the trick is put it in a text file and run it like a script. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Let me get rid of this actually. This is my pencil project from earlier today. I'm gonna I'm gonna create a generic uh, project just like I did on the Windows side because now I'm on the Mac side. So I'm gonna go new. I've got Android project as a default type, so I'll use that. I'm just gonna go test next. And uh, what was that, a 2.33 or something? 2.2, let's select that one. You still have to select the right API for the right emulator. So that was a 2.2, I believe, or 2.3. So I'm going to go 2.2 just to be safe. I'm going to go next. I'm going to go to edu.itu.test. Go finish. So now I have a test project. And if I run this test project here, it's going to want to go to the AVD. And I've got some AVD set up. If I go into the window and I look at the AVD manager, I have one right here for 2.2. So if I automatically just you know do what I was doing before, go in here and say run Android application, it's going to bring up that AVD manager automatically. Not necessarily what I want. So instead, I want to use that VirtualBox that I installed. Actually, it's not doing anything at all, is it? Maybe it is. Let's see. It's not going to connect it. Ah, I did connect it. You know why? Because the script is probably running. 
All right, bad example. There is a script that you're supposed to run, but I have it running automatically because I'm too, um, too lazy. So I like to automate stuff. So let me show you the script. <laughs> my script is running when my computer boots, so my AVD is always connected. However, your AVD is not going to be connected automatically until you create the script. What is the script I'm talking about? If I look in my home directory, I've got a script that's called uh, Android. Android, here it is here. If I take a look at this, um, no, 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 no. Um, let me bring it up in the text edit so I can actually make the text bigger. Let me just make sure I called it that. Hold on one second. Emulator. It's called Emulator. Uh, not Android. If I type in Emulator, it's going to run a script for me. The script is going to connect, and it's running the AVD manager. And it, the, the trick is it connects, connects the virtual machine and virtual box to the AVD manager through the port. And the port set up through port forwarding. And the trick is once you set it up and you set the script to run automatically, it's as if running it, like you just saw a few minutes ago, the program actually runs in the emulator automatically for you. So the components to that is twofold. One, write the script. What does the script look like? And the script, and I have this all written down actually in the instructions on the readme file. So if you don't get this, don't, don't be too terribly concerned. Uh, the script in here I have is called emulator, and I believe emulator is in my home directory. Uh, I guess it is. So let me just find it real quick here. Uh, it's not a text file, is it? Uh, no, I set the I set the rights to. Uh, what is it? Cat? No, to type it out, it's. Uh, no. Huh? For editor? No, to actually nano. There we go. I'll just do nano. <laughs> And there it is. Here's the contents of the script. What is the script doing? Well, it's kind of low tech. It's running from users, Behacker, Android platform tools, which is the directory for which the Android tools is running in. It's running the ADB. The ADB is the ADB manager. And the ADB manager is running, and you just basically have to copy this down. It's actually in the instructions in the readme file. Put it into a text file. Change the rights to the text file to make it executable. Put it in your startup scripts, if you go that far. You don't even have to do it that far. You could just type this in if you wanted to, to connect it. And if you're doing that, what you do is basically go to a, a shell. If you have problems doing this, I can actually assist you with this on an individual basis as well, because depending upon where you have things located, you could put the file in different locations. If I look at this directory, it's in users be hacker. If I change the directory to Android, I do a list out here. I see the subdirectory platform tools. And then inside of platform tools, if I actually type this in correctly, platform slash tools. There we go. I see a command called ADB. It's going to give me an error message because I haven't ADB. There it is. Because I haven't given it the proper parameters. ADB, you can actually go ADB space and then the name of the emulator, and you can actually run the Android emulators. That's when I remember when I was in the Windows partition and I double clicked on the, the SDK manager and brought up the SDK window. The same thing happens actually. You can double click on the ADB and it will bring up the ADB, which is. Android uh, virtual device. The AVD is a virtual device is what it stands for. The ADB manager is the manager for these devices. And what you're doing is you're adding it, this device, on a port that you're going to define, which is step number two, that is going to connect the built-in ADB with this virtual box AD, AVD so that you have um, you know, a seamless kind of integration. So when you when you click on the option to run the project, it brings it up into the virtual box emulator instead of the emulator that comes with the 
SDK, which is long story short. So the script itself looks like this. The syntax for the script, the entire, is in the readme file. So I'm not doing this justice, but uh, the readme file will go through at a lot slower pace. What you're doing in the emulator, let me just show you that real quick. The missing link that you'll need to do is uh, set a port forwarding, which is essentially, uh, let me just shut this one down for a second so I can go back into the emulator. Here we go. If I go into the settings and I go into the networking part, and you see the menu looks slightly different on a Windows system. It's the same options, but it looks slightly different on the Mac than it does on the Windows. And this is also probably an older version of VirtualBox. The newer one, they made some cosmetic changes to it. If I click on the networking tab, which is the same as on your version, and um, you go and you click on the advanced to open that up, the networking tab is going to give you the flow through for the internet access. When you originally install it, if you don't get internet access through that virtual box ISO image that you've booted up, you can't get an internet connection, then go to the settings into the network and make sure you have this set on NAT, which is going to be a shared host. So it's sharing your Windows or your Mac internet access instead of, you know, bridged. So NAT's actually more generic as an option. If you go online and you look at the documentation for VirtualBox, it explains all the differences between all of them. From personal experience, that works the best. And the way that you identify the emulator is to put on some port forwarding. If you click on port forwarding on the bottom of the screen here, and I know I'm running late for you guys, um, if you click on this button up here to add, what you're going to do is you're going to add, I'll just put another one in here at the bottom. So I've got rule number one, rule number two now, so I can delete rule number two if I want to. But what I've done is I've put in the host and the guest is 555. So basically this is going to reroute traffic that is sent to port 555. And as I'm basically telling the emulator that my ISO is running on 555 port. So anything that is routed to 555 is going to be forwarded, which is why they call it port forwarding. And again, another Linux kind of terminology. Uh, but long story short, I don't want to cancel this. Uh, let's say do that. Yes, okay. Let's cancel this out. When you run this command down here, it's the one that's connecting. So you see, this is the command here that's running. It's ADB connect local host, which is my computer from a networking. If you're not familiar with networking, this makes absolutely no sense to you. To 555, which is the port that they said the emulator is sitting on. When you run this, the ADB automatically identifies and forwards to this port. So what you can do, and... Uh, and I might end up having to do this for you on an individual basis once you've tried it and you can't get it figured out. I'll just set it up for you. It takes like five seconds. <laughs> so if you can get it, if you can get VirtualBox installed, if you can get the images downloaded, I'll make it work for you. But each system is slightly different. So you may or may not, depending upon your networking background, you may or may not be able to get this to work properly. Um, but long story short, when you right mouse click on the project to run it, and you go in to run as if you run the configurations down here on the bottom, you can select a modified configuration. In fact, I have one set up here. And you can select the target and put it on manual. If you put it on manual, then at runtime, you can select what you want, which is a different option than I have. I had it set on automatic. So I put it on manual. And let me show you what this happens, actually. When, it, when you run it, you get this little screen that comes up. And the screen is going to give you your emulators that are going to show up in here. So if I go like this, let me just show you what happens actually. I'll close this window. Let's, let me get out of here because I have this file open. If I run the emulator, or the, the, unable to connect, oh, that's great. Uh, my system's a little messed up right now uh, because I've run it at boot. So I'm trying to run it on top of a, and I've run it a second time. So I've got two. Two ADBs running at the same time, which is why my fan's going off on my computer right now. But anyway, long story short, 
The emulator list of all the ones you have in VirtualBox should show up, the ones that you have running. Actually, it's not running. That's the problem. So if I run it, we should see it populate into that screen. And this is essentially your connection. So once it runs up and you set the forwarding, the Android device chooser, which is part of the ABD manager, which is that add-on tool that you installed, you went through that earlier install, is going to identify this virtual machine running to VirtualBox and put it in this window here so you can select it and then you can select do I want to run it in an Android one or do I want to choose it from one of my existing emulators that are running and this is the connecting this is the component that connects the two of them together. Unfortunately what I did is I had this automatically set up <laughs> and I can do it for you um, no problem. Uh, but hold on one second. Unlock this guy. This is the tedious parts. So this guy is now running. So if I go out and I try to connect it, see it populated. I don't know if you saw that, but now it's in here and it's localhost five five five. It 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 put itself in here. Because that command that I just ran a few minutes ago, that I just ran the script essentially again, and uh, what, what that did was told the AVD manager that that emulator is on port 555 and connect to it. So it connected to it. So now I can go like this, I can select it. If I had like three or four different ones from different ISOs, from different builds that I wanted to run, I could optionally select that. When I do that, I come out over here, and lo and behold, there's my Hello World application that's running in the emulator. So what ends up happening, and the reason why I'm showing this to you, once you have it configured, it's, it's a beautiful thing, because you load the emulator, you leave it on there, you build project after project, it takes you two seconds. Did you see how fast that ran? It, take, it would take me 15 minutes to get it running on the other emulator. And if you don't have a device, this is a great substitute. And even if you have a device, it's still faster because you're still going to take, and Monday I'll bring a device with me and we'll take, we'll copy the APK file onto the device and we'll see it working from the device. So, and eventually the pieces will come together and you'll figure out what you feel comfortable using. I'm an emulator person, I'm not really a device tester. Some people love devices, they don't want to use the emulators. Some people don't like VirtualBox, I don't want to mess with it, it seems like a lot of work. And I just made it sound like a lot of work, but it, it isn't really that much work. So. It's worth the investment. Uh, if you can get the pieces installed, I'll configure it for you. <laughs> Just you know, catch me before or after class, and I'll configure it for you. So, I think we had enough for today. What do you think? Yeah. All right. So questions, comments, concerns. I'm going to hang around, and I'm going to help people right now. So, let me stop the video.